Welcome to the Bar Exam Toolbox Podcast. Today we're talking about how to improve a poor MBE score. Your Bar Exam Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We're here to demystify the bar exam experience so you can study effectively, stay sane, and hopefully pass and move on with your life. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website Career Dicta. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on your favorite listening app and check out our sister podcast, the Law School Toolbox Podcast. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact forum on barexamtoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast. Today, we're talking about how to improve a not-so-great MBE score. Wally, what are some of the reasons that you have heard from people who struggle with the MBE? And I know we've talked to a lot of these people over time. Oh, yes. Well, the most common answer is I was never very good at multiple choice. Yeah, <laughs> I think that always definitely hear that. that one a lot. <laughs> hear that one a lot. I, but my counterpoint to that is, I mean, the MBE is a little different than other multiple choice tests. So sure, there are people who are just better standardized test takers, but the MBE is not the SAT. It is, it is right. a very different beast. Yeah, and I think some of the tactics that people have kind of learned to deal with things like the SAT and the LSAT don't even really necessarily apply to the MBE. So yeah. I guess sometimes people are carrying over these ideas of like, oh, you should always read the answer choices first or whatever. Um, they just really actually don't work that well with the MBE. Mm-hmm. Um, so I definitely hear a lot of people tell me that like they've just never been that good at, at multiple choice. You know, they struggled with multiple choice in law school. They struggled with the LSAT. Um, and, you know, that's that is a situation. Like some people are definitely better at this sort of thing than others. Um, but unfortunately, the reality is you still got to take the MBE. Yep. And the MBE is hard. It's very hard. <laughs> it's just hard. It's very hard. A passing score on the MBE is like a C. I yeah. mean, it's which I guess is technically passing, but it doesn't feel like passing to most people. I mean, it's right. It's we're not overachievers. Good. Of the yeah, best you know, of the world. Exactly. So the test is hard. They set it up to feel very hard, and that can't be discounted. Um, so you do want to be aware that. Even for most people, this part of the test is going to feel a bit like an uphill battle. Oh, I remember what the first time, I mean, the first bar exam I took, I did the MBE day first, um, and then like the SA day in the state I was taking it in was second. And I remember afterwards talking to my friend who had taken it in New York, and he was finished because they'd done the other day first. And I was just like, I don't even know if I'm going tomorrow. Like, I definitely failed this test. And he was like, are you joking? Like, there's no way that you're fa- – I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, I didn't. I don't think I got a single question right, and, like, I'm good at standardized testing. Um, and I think in reality I can remember, like, three questions from the entire day that I was sure I'd missed. And he's like, yeah, maybe you missed those three. I'm sure, that, <laughs> you know, like, you still need to go to the next day of the test. Um, and I'm actually a person who's really good at standardized testing and kind of got through life on, like, you know, the SAT and the LSAT and things like that. But it's a really, really difficult test. So. You know, it is definitely the hardest multiple choice test I've taken. I've taken a lot of like grad school admissions tests and things like that. And it's just a different level. Yeah. I also think that questions do seem to be shifting a little bit from what some of the prep companies are using, um, which is also making it tough for people to prep. I also heard some feedback today that I think is true as well is depending on your prep company. Um, sometimes they don't really give you a lot of explanations for the questions. So you really have to understand like how to prep. <laughs> and by explanation, I mean, it's like, oh, you do a question and they'll tell you that the it's C is right, but maybe there's not a paragraph explaining why C is right or why the right. other options are wrong. And so you it can also just be very hard to prep because you think you have all these tools, but if you're consistently only getting 50% you know, or less right, and you are not getting enough feedback on why that's happening from your prep program, well, that's problematic. Or if the questions in your prep program don't look like the real MBE, well, that's also problematic. So it can be kind of a tough nut to crack about how you're going to prepare for it. I know we're going to talk a little bit about the different tools you can use, but it is something you want to be aware of. Yeah, definitely. I feel like I have been hearing more and more from people that, you know, I prepared for the MBE in this way. And then I went in and the test seemed really different. 
Um, and sometimes what people are using to prepare, yeah, that kind of makes sense because they weren't actually real MBE questions to start with. But it does seem like they're kind of at least shifting formats and things. And I think we had a conversation a couple of years ago with someone at Adaptabar kind of about this topic. And she was telling us, you know, they've even taken the licensed questions and tried to reshape them into a different format or something like that to more closely mimic the questions that they're putting out now. But, you know, the reality is the NCBE does not actually license that many MBE questions to anyone. And everyone kind of has the same questions. Um, and most of those are frankly pretty out of date. They haven't licensed a whole lot. I mean, we license them. You know, they haven't licensed a whole lot of really recent questions. So it is, I think, kind of an open question to what extent the actual test is changing or not. And I don't really have an answer to that, but I think it's definitely something people have flagged for us. Yeah, especially, I mean, CivPro hasn't even been tested that long on the MBE, and there really aren't very many of those questions floating around. Right, true. <laughs> yeah, we even know. had to write some of those. <laughs> right, we just like wrote some because it was very, it was very hard. So it is, um, you really have to think about, you know, using prep companies. And if you're worried about the questions that are coming from your prep company, it can make sense to balance it with something else. So we can talk about that a little bit more, but you definitely don't want to just go all in with one viewpoint of the MBE <laughs> and then right. find out when you sit for the MBE that it feels different. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that makes this test really difficult is that a lot of the questions require a very detailed knowledge of the law. Mm -hmm. So if you are not a person who's kind of that detail oriented, this can be a real challenge because they are able to test very specific nuances. And granted, they test the same rules over and over. So if you do enough questions, you'll probably see the same law coming up. And that's one of the ways that you can learn the material. But you know, having kind of this high level understanding of a topic is not really necessarily what you need to get these questions correct. No. <laughs> I was just, <laughs> no. I was thinking about this a lot because I was participating in a tutoring session that we were running for a group of students at a law school on evidence. And we were using bar questions to talk about um, prior bad acts and character evidence, like 404B, and in an area that is pretty decently tested on the MBE because the rules are so detailed and convoluted. I mean, it's just exactly. like, it's like, oh, well, this person can testify about this, but not if it's on direct, only if it's on, you know, I mean, it's like super nitpicky, super nitpicky. And, you know, it always makes me kind of just like roll my eyes when you get to this law that they love to test on the MBE because it's so easy to write the questions. The law is so nitpicky. It's very easy for them to test on it. So, you know, there are these areas like statistically, we know the most heavily tested areas of the law um, in on the MBE, and some of them are going to be nitpicky and you just have to learn all those details. I mean, it's not fun. But if 404B and 404A, all of those, the character like exceptions are going to show up, you just have to learn them and practice yeah, them. And, I think and eventually we'll memorize them, but they're just kind of painful to memorize. Yeah. And I think there's just a, there are some of those topics that people just really hate, like all of the like recording stuff and the mortgages oh. and oh some of gosh, just, mortgages. Some of I know. I felt your pay. Someone was complaining to me yesterday about how they felt like every MBE question was on mortgages. I was like, oh, you and Lee both. Yes. She I know, says that about I her know. bar. I, I feel <laughs> like that was exactly what happened to my bar, even though I know it's statistically impossible. And they don't teach that in law school. It's so oh, unfair. Yeah. It's so unfair. I, yeah. I mean, every now and then that is like a real life one that actually comes up. You're like, oh, I wonder if this person recorded their deed. You know? I know. It's so true. <laughs> I know. We've been talking a lot of real estate law lately. <laughs> yeah, it is actually ironically like, you know, I hated learning it for the bar, but I will say it is probably one of those topics that in real life has come up more than any other thing that I had to study for the bar. Yeah. Um, wills and trusts also kind of important to learn. Yeah, true. Um, yeah, that, keep, <laughs> that comes up quite a bit. I also think that a lot of people struggle with fatigue and time management, um, and these can be a little tricky to work on. I think fatigue especially. I think that's one of the things that often um, folks don't realize that they're dealing with. You know, you might find that these sections of the test are exhausting. I mean, it's three hours of multiple choice. And that's yeah. a lot. Um, twice in one day. But there can be fatigue within the test itself. Like after an hour, you can find that it's much harder to focus and then you kind of have to do something to refocus. You have to be very aware of the way that 
fatigue will hit you. There, are, It's not just like by the end of the day, you're tired. It can even right. happen within the three hour sections. Oh, definitely. Um, I remember when I took the LSAT, I had not adequately prepared by taking full tests. I'd kind of done different sections of them. And I recall getting my score report and I had missed something like 90% of the questions I missed on the test. I missed in the very last section. Um, yeah. And obviously I was just tired. Um, I mean, the problem with the MBE is it's, you know, you want to be practicing these three hour blocks, but it's kind of hard to get that many questions. And so, yeah. you know, I think it is an important thing to do. Um, but you know, the reality is you probably can't do it 10 times just because you don't have that many questions. Yeah. Which is why I do think we often recommend, even if you're not doing three hour sets of MBE questions, but studying in those three hour blocks, um, to just force yourself to sit in one spot and do the work for three hours can still help with that stamina. Um, oh, you know, sure. if you're somebody who's used to getting up and getting a snack every hour, it can be really hard to sit and, and focus and work for those three hour blocks. Yeah. And I think it's fine to take a break once or twice in the session if it helps refresh you. I mean, I definitely remember doing that. You know, I'd get up, go to the bathroom, like splash some water on my face, do a few jumping jacks and then come back. Um, but you know, unfortunately they won't let you have food or coffee or anything like that most places. So you're going to have to kind of work on building that stamina. Um, and you know, just kind of even just the keeping track of your time, you know, do you have a strategy for keeping track of your time? One of the things I think people really ought to be doing is figuring out in advance, you know, what question number should you be on after the first hour? What questions should you be on? And maybe even every 30 minutes so that if you're falling behind, you can kind of like speed some stuff up. Yeah. But you don't want to be thinking about that in the exam. Like figure that stuff out yeah. in advance and just like write it down on a piece of paper as soon as they start the clock so that you can just keep an eye on where you are. And sometimes people start rushing through and go too quickly too. It's very true. Yeah. That is definitely a mistake I have made over the years with the MBE is if you, you're like, oh, well, I'm just, you know, moving through them. They're so direct it's like they're not they're not right actually yeah you, you shouldn't be spending the boat <laughs> yeah I mean, if you're spending if you're on average spending one minute per question like you're probably moving too quickly mm -hmm. yeah exactly yeah sometimes i talk to people and like oh i had 30 minutes left at the end i'm like how is that possible yeah that's like you know, not like a good, should, that's like not a good sign you should not <laughs> you have had 30 minutes left <laughs> no like five minutes when sure, is one thing great. 30 minutes yeah, yeah not no, five no, minutes no. you know you go back you check the couple you basically make sure you bubbled correctly you check the like you know couple that you circled to go back to yep. in your answer but fine that's five minutes 30 minutes you've got a problem yeah exactly all right, so let's say you've taken the exam and you might see a breakdown of how you did in different areas. Sometimes those breakdowns we're talking to you, California, are odd because they just, like California just tells you what percentage Oh, everyone people, does. Oh, is it now everyone? Well, yes, if, you're right. If, I was just looking at it yeah, yeah. At, no, if another the, one I this morning. Yeah, if the state even releases the information, which some do and some don't, they all have it structured the same way, and the structure of it's very confusing. So we'll just spend two seconds explaining to you what these actually it's mean. So it's so confusing. It's so confusing. Like even sometimes our tutors are like, "Wait, am I thinking about this correctly?" Like I, so what those numbers are showing you, and so basically they give you a breakdown by subject matter area, and then they give you an overall breakdown as a percentage. Um, and you might think that, you know, it's the percentage of questions you got right. It's That's not what it is. I don't know why they don't just tell you that. Um, I think it's because they don't want people calculating the math. That's why they I guess. don't do it. Yeah, it just yeah. seems like it would be way more straightforward just to be like, great, you got 50% in this topic and 80% in this topic. It's not what it's saying. What the numbers are saying is how you did relative to other people who took the test. So say that everybody bombed property. Well, you might show that you had, you know, a percentage of 80%, which is good. I mean, that's great. You did better than 80% of the people. It doesn't really tell you anything about how you did in property, but at yeah. least it can kind of give you a sense of where you probably are relative to where you need to be. So if you see a high number, that means you did above average basically in that topic area. And if you see a low number, it means you did not do that well. So you probably need to look at that again. Yeah, I mean, I try and look for those big swings. You yeah, know? I look it's for like, like the gaps. Like, where are the differences? Right, right. But I wouldn't make any study decisions between a subject I got 34% on versus 45%. Right. You know, you got to work on both of those. <laughs> like I mean, it's just, yeah. Because the numbers aren't really that that telling. But if you got 
you know, in 18, you only did better than 18% on one and you did better than 90% on another subject. Well, you probably are much stronger in that other subject. Yeah. So and the you question, can take away from that. Yeah. The question I like to ask people kind of is like, you know, do these numbers sort of correspond to your understanding of this topic? And yeah. sometimes they're like, yeah, you know, I've always been really bad at like con law. Okay. We can take this information and know that you need to do more practice or more studying in con law. But if they're like, well, I don't know, like, not really. It's like maybe it's just random. Um, yeah. And, you know, if, if people have failed multiple times, it might shift all over the place or it might stay consistent. If it stays consistent, again, it's like, well, this is a pattern. Um, and if it's all over the place, and it's like, well, you know, you just did okay on this part this day. Yep. Yeah. It's strange. I know. I just, it's, it just adds this mystique to the test, too. It's like, ooh, we won't even tell you what the real scores are. We're going to yeah, just these weird percentages. I just find it weird. I'm like, why not just give people the breakdown of how they did? Wouldn't that be more, mm -hmm. like, better, easier, more, like, useful for people? Yep. I know. But, you know, it's the bar. They do what they it's, want. Exactly. They don't really care what we think. So right. Nobody asked us. <laughs> yeah. All right. So if you've been struggling with the MBE, there are things that you can do. All is not lost. Um, so, you know, we were already kind of alluding to this earlier that there are a lot of different tools out there, some of them even newer, um, that you can use to practice and you should try them out and see what makes sense to you. Yeah. You know, I think the classic is like the Adaptabar, um, UWorld has arrived on the scene in the last few years. There's also the classic strategies and tactics series of books that a lot of students like a lot. Um, and, you know, I think ideally you want to make sure if you can, you're getting some type of data. So, you know, if it's not financially like out of the question, I would probably get an Adaptabar UWorld type solution because you want that data breakdown of how am I doing across different topics? Because they will actually tell you how you are doing in a different topic area, um, you know, and that you might be getting 50% on one topic and 80% on another. Well, Lee, which of those do you think you need to study more? <laughs> yeah, probably not the 80%. No. Right. And also, like, you shouldn't just be doing the same number of questions in each of those topics just because some schedule tells you to study, like, torts. It's like you're already getting 80 plus percent in torts. You don't need to spend time on it. Yep. Or at least exactly. not as much time as you spend on something that you're getting 50% right. Because which is going to be easier to make up the points? It's like, well, yep. if the average that you need to get is 70 and you're already over that, you don't have that much room to grow. If yeah. you're under it, you got a lot of room to grow. So focus on yep. those things. Exactly. So you also need to figure out like why you're missing questions. And oh, yeah. this seems so simple, but I think this is a big struggling point for a lot of people is they, when I ask like, why do you think you're struggling? And they're just kind of like, well, I don't, I know the law. I hear that all the time. I know the law. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, we need more information about why you're missing questions. Right. And, and I, it seems like an easy question, but it's, it's not always the easiest to get an answer for. No, and I think one thing people can do to kind of try to identify the problem, and, you know, we've had students have real success with this, is slow down and start doing these questions open book and untimed until you can get them consistently correct. Because yep. if you can't get a question right when you have as much time as you want, you can look up the law. Like, you need to get some type of help at that point, because if you can't get it right in that circumstance, how in the world are you going to get it right under time conditions when you don't have the ability to look anything up? Yep. I mean, you have to figure out, like, what's happening, and you just can't do that if you're just, like, burning through 30 questions, and then you're like, oh, I got 50% of them right, yeah, and then you just, like, on. keep going. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the other things that is a huge mistake people make is – they don't make sure that they got a question right for the right reason. Right. Um, because when you do those 30, and I mean, I remember doing this when I was studying for the bar, you do a set of 30 questions and you get 15 of them wrong. You only look at the 15 you got wrong. Right. But you probably guessed on some of the other 15 <laughs> and, yeah. and you didn't necessarily get them right for the right reasons. And that is still problematic. So you really have to study. That's why the slowing down can be really helpful because you do have to study all the questions. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you're doing a set of questions, you can track your confidence level. Um, you know, so if I'm 100% sure I got this question right, I might give myself, you know, 100%. If I'm 50%, 50%. If I'm totally guessing, I might get a zero. 
and then go back and actually look at what you got right and wrong. So, you know, if you were 100% confident on a question, you got it wrong, that's yeah. actually a great learning opportunity because you clearly do not know what you're talking about on that subject. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You know? Like, and yep, you know, it's like you need to understand that, like, wow, I was completely off base. Why yep. is that? Right. Um, and, you, and if you're guessing, it's like, great, you guessed correctly, but that doesn't mean anything. Um, so one of the things we'll sometimes have students do is actually write down the law for any question that they miss or that they guess on and, you know, have sort of a set of, I guess, rules, basically, that they go back and they study and they review until they can actually adequately apply that law to a new question because these rules do just come up over and over. Yeah. I mean, they can only get so creative with some of these rules. There's like a limited set, you know? <laughs> yeah. And when we were developing our practice of the week program that we call POW, um, one of the one things that we did was we slowed the process down and we really broke up the questions and started to say like, okay, what's the law that you needed to know? What's, how are, do you, would you read the facts? Let's issue spot the facts. Let's now look at the answer choices. And just by taking things step by step, you get a clarity on these questions that you just don't get when you are plowing through them. Oh, definitely. And I think one of the things that we were most interested to find out, which I was very surprised about when we were developing this content, there are not two basically correct answers. There is one right. correct answer. Um, yep. And, you know, when people tell me like, oh, I can get it down to the last two, I'm like, then you're not understanding something because these actually do when you have, you know, unlimited time, unlimited resources, you can talk through the question with somebody who's also an expert. There's always a right answer on the page. Um, and it's, and I, I mean, I know people will push back on this, but I will tell you after doing these and we can like, you know, you can get POW and you can see us work through these questions. There is there's no ambiguity about which question, which answer choice is the correct one, basically. Right. And it's I really think you have, to, you have to remember, like, the, they test these questions. They, right, all of the MBEs have sample questions on them because they're trying to see if there's ambiguity, right? They're right. trying no, they, to see yeah. if, it, if it works. So there is a right answer, and they've been vetted, and it's your job to find the right answer. Yeah, they've basically validated these questions as questions. And if you get something totally weird, like maybe it's a fake question, you know, maybe it's one yep. that they haven't quite fine tuned enough. Um, but if you apply the law to the facts and kind of formulate your answer choice and then look at the answers, there's always going to be something that is correct on the page. Yep. Um, so I know people will resist that and tell me like, oh, that's totally crazy. But I'm telling you, this is what we found out. I know. I know. So, you know, all of these things are things to try. And I think one of the things to think about is trying to start them early in the process. So the MBE, if you aren't st currently studying for the bar, is a great place to start practicing like during the second half of your 3L year if you want to start some early bar prep. Because this slow work that we're talking about can be done like in the spring. So you can start to up your confidence and then you don't have the pressure of the exam date, like barreling down at you. Right. <laughs> like, and then you're like, you're, you're not listening to this saying like, Lee and Allison, you guys are crazy. I don't have time to sit down and spend like five to seven minutes work working on a question. What's wrong with you? Like who and has like, time for true. that? I've got to get through my, my question set. It's on the schedule. You, you <laughs> told me in the last podcast that I had to do 2,000 questions. How am I going to get my 2,000 questions done? So you still have time to slow down and get your 2,000 questions in, but you also have more time if you start in the spring and can kind of chip away at this, especially if you're someone who has struggled with the MBE in the past. So, you know, if you are listening to this and you haven't started bar prep yet, um, I think it's a really good technique to do. Yeah, definitely. And like when we say slow down and do the open book and that kind of thing, we're not saying forever um, and or even every question. I mean, it's clearly important that you build your stamina for doing timed sets and that you do them. I mean, by the end, you know, before the exam, you should be doing them for three hours at a time. Um, but, you know, I think as you're studying, you can mix in these different options. So maybe you do 30 questions and you see how that's going. And then maybe you spend an hour where you go through even the questions that you missed, like really slowly, like figure out why you missed these questions. Um, and then try to find some similar questions and, you know, can you apply what you learned to them? I mean, I think that's one of the things I like about the PAL program is 
we go through a question on the video and kind of work through a question. And then we give you, as the student, we give you a second question on a similar topic for you to practice. And so the idea is that should also be a flag for you. Like, if you saw us apply this particular law, can you then apply it to a new question? And if not, why not? Like, what's happening? Yep. You just have to constantly be evaluating. And I think that that is its in itself can be very exhausting, right? right? You're constantly saying like, how is this going? Like, why do these all seem so hard? I can't believe I have to go back and redo them. I can't believe I have to do them under time conditions. I can't believe I have to spend an hour viewing them. But this is how you learn. This is the heavy lifting. It's yeah, just and I, unfortunate. There's no magic bullet for this. No, there's really not. I mean, a lot of it is just pattern recognition. And the more you see and the more you do, the more you see certain patterns that maybe you know you usually get the question wrong. I mean, for me, it was the Fourth Amendment. I got all the Fourth Amendment questions <laughs> wrong for a very long time until I really yep. sat down with that law and was like, oh, oh, this is not my impression at all. I thought the police could do whatever they wanted. Um, and they can't really. So, you know, I had to sit and learn those rules I do think sometimes people kind of freak out a little bit if they're using Adaptabar and they feel like the questions are getting harder. Um, but that's actually not a misimpression. It's kind of the goal because they're feeding you questions that they think you do not know. Right. And so sometimes people will freak out because like their scores start dropping and they're like, I'm, you know, I'm not making progress. I'm moving the wrong direction. And I think this is a little bit unfortunate in the way that they do like the scoring, but I think it's also a valuable exercise to be practicing more of the questions that you're worse at because those are the ones yep. you can learn to get better at. Yep. Unfortunately, bar prep isn't designed to make you feel good. No. <laughs> it's just not. <laughs> like, no, the mean, heavy lifting makes you feel like uncomfortable and questions your abilities because you're pushing yourself at the stuff that is hard. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're, if you are feeling that, if you're doing adaptive bar, like then it might make sense to sit down and do like 30 questions of a mixed set that are just ones that you randomly get from somewhere, like to kind of improve your confidence and see, okay, you know, this is a little bit telling me more where I am in the moment versus just constantly challenging me. Yep. I think that's very true. Well, any final thoughts as we wrap up this episode? Well, the one thing I would say is like we kind of circling back to the beginning said, this is a legitimately difficult test. And so if you are struggling with this portion of the bar exam, you definitely are not alone. Um, and even people who are very, very strong standardized test takers find this test difficult. So I think you've got to kind of separate that difficulty level and that level of struggle from like, I'm totally bombing this and I don't know what else to do because I think at that point it's time to kind of call in an outside expert and like talk to them. I mean, there's specific MBE tutors we know, like we work with students on this, but you kind of have to have somebody figure out with you, like what is going on here and like, why am I not able to get these questions correct? Yeah. And I think I would add to that, that now that we have really dug into the MBE over the years, it, it just looks like such a different test than when I was doing my prep <laughs> because I just never did such a deep dive into really studying these questions because you do just get caught up in the like, do your 30 or 40 questions, check which ones you got right. Oh, you got a bunch wrong. Moving on, you know, and it is worth it to really pull it apart and start to see that there is one right answer and why there is right one right answer and why you're getting questions wrong. And can you, you know, fix some of the habits that you have um, that are causing to lead you to the wrong answer? There is work to be done here, um, but you have to kind of get out of your own way, especially if you haven't been great at standardized tests and really like learn this part of the test. It's learnable. It yeah. just like it really takes kind of like diving in and not just getting caught up in the like, well, this is the part I'm not going to do well in. So yeah, because yeah. unfortunately, it's a large portion of the test. And if you sink yep. yourself on the MBE, like it's going to be tough to make up. I mean, one thing I will throw in uh, that people might consider if they have a lot of timing problems, um, which is an idea we got once from an LSAT tutor, is actually just slow down. And maybe you don't finish, say, 10 questions at the end. But if you drastically increase your accuracy on all the other questions, it might actually really be worth it for your score. So, you know, if you know that you're just not going to get through every single question, like take a little bit of a pause, take a deep breath and experiment at least with taking a little bit more time and then guessing on, you know, 10 questions at the end and see if that improves your score. Yep. Very true. All right. Well, I think with that, we are out of time. 
I want to take a second to remind you to check out our blog at baregamtoolbox.com, which is full of helpful tips to help you prepare and stay sane as you study for the bar exam. You can also find information on our website about our courses, tools, and one-on-one tutoring programs to support you as you study for the UBE or California bar exam. If you enjoyed this episode of the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review on your favorite listening app. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you're still in law school, you might also like to check out our Law School Toolbox podcast as well. If you have any other questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at Lee at BarExamToolbox.com or Allison at BarExamToolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at BarExamToolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon. Thank you.